السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته إن الحمد لله نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونعوذ بالله من شرور أنفسنا ومن سيئات أعمالنا من يحده الله فلا مضل له ومن يضلل فلا هادي له وأشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له وأشهد أن محمدا عبده ورسوله أما بعد فإن أصدق الحديث كتاب الله وخير الهدي هدي محمد صلى الله عليه وسلم وشر الأمور محدثاتها وكل محدثة بدعة وكل بدعة ضلالة وكل ضلالة في النار أما بعد So today in the explanation of Kitab al-Tawheed Sharh al-Mujaz al-Mumahad of Sheikh Ahmed al-Najmi Rahimahullahu ta'ala We have reached chapter number 58 In my counting Which is the chapter The statement of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala Yadhunnuna billahi ghayr al-haqqi Dhan al-jahiliyyati Which is the chapter The statement of Allah the most high They thought wrongly of Allah the thought of jahiliya, the thought of ignorance. Then he mentioned Shaykh al-Islam Muhammad bin Abdul Wahhab rahimahullah, qawli Allah ta'ala, the statement of Allah the Most High, yadhunnuna billahi ghayr al-haqqi dhanna al-jahiliya. They thought wrongly of Allah, the thought of ignorance. يَقُولُونَ هَلْ لَنَا مِنَ الْأَمْرِ مِنْ شَيْءٍ قُلْ إِنَّ إِنَّ الْأَمْرَ كُلَّهُ لِلَّهِ يُخْفُونَ فِي أَنفُسِهِمْ مَا لَا مَا لَا يَبْدُونَ لَكَ مَا لَا يُبْدُونَ لَكَ يَقُولُونَ لَوْ كَانَ لَنَا مِنَ الْأَمْرِ شَيْءٌ مَا قُتِلْنَا هَا هُنَا قُلْ لَوْ كُنْتُمْ فِي بُيُوتِكُمْ لَبَرَزَ الَّذِينَ كُتِبَ عَلَيْهُمُ الْقَتْلُ إِلَى مَدَاجِئِهِمْ وَلِيَبْتَلِيَ اللَّهُ مَا فِي صُدُورِكُمْ وَلِيُمَحِّسَ مَا فِي قَلُوبِكُمْ وَاللَّهُ عَلِيمٌ بِذَاتِ الصُّدُورِ Wherein Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala stated in this ayah in surah Ali Imran They thought wrongly of Allah the thought of ignorance and they said do we have any share or any part in the affair? Say to them, O Prophet, the affair wholly belongs to Allah. And they hide within themselves what they dare not reveal to you. And they say, regarding the battle of Uhud, if we had anything to do with the affair, none of us would have been killed here. So say to them, Rather, even if you had remained in your homes, then for those whom death had been decreed, it would have reached them in their places of death, or even in their beds. And that Allah might test you, that Allah might test what is in your breasts, and that He might purge what is in your hearts, and Allah knows what is in the chests of people. And likewise the statement of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, أَذَّانِّينَ بِاللَّهِ ذَنَّ السَّوْءِ عَلَيْهِمْ دَائِرَةُ السَّوْءِ The statement of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, those who think evil thoughts about Allah, then for them, is a disgraceful torment. For them, is a disgraceful torment. Ibn Qayyim, rahimahullah ta'ala, he said regarding the first ayah, from Ali Imran, that Ibn Qayyim said that this thought of theirs, this dhan, yadhunnuna billahi ghayr al-haqqi dhan al-jahiliyya, that this thought, that this wrong thought that they had 
is interpreted to mean that they thought that Allah would not help his messenger and that his mission would fail. And it is also interpreted to mean that they thought whatever the believers were afflicted with, it was not from the decree of Allah and the wisdom of Allah. So, it is on their behalf a rejection of the wisdom of Allah and his qadr, his pre-decree. And a rejection of the fact that the affair of Allah's Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam will indeed be completed and fulfilled. And that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will make his religion manifest over all other religions. And this was the evil thought that the hypocrites and the mushrikeen had as occurs in Surah Al-Fatih, which is the following ayah that we mentioned. The following ayah that we mentioned. Meaning the ayah, those who, ha- those who think evil thoughts about Allah, for them is a disgraceful torment. That this was the evil thought they had. And it is not befitting to ascribe these things to Allah or to the wisdom of Allah or to his praiseworthiness or his truthful promises. We are not to have evil thoughts regarding any of that. So whomsoever thinks that Allah makes falsehood prevail over the truth with an established and permanent prevailing by which the truth is vanquished and lost, Or he denies that which occurs by the decree of Allah and the ordainment of Allah. Or he denies that which occurs by the decree of Allah in accordance to the wisdom of Allah, which is complete and far-reaching, which makes Allah deserving of all praise. Rather, this denier may even claim that what takes place is due to an abstract and independent will, not connected to the wisdom of Allah. And this is the thought processes of those who disbelieve. So woe to those who disbelieve. Woe to those who disbelieve from the fire. And then he continued, and most of the people have evil thoughts regarding Allah in those issues that affect them specifically and in what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does to others. And none is saved from that except the one who is truly acquainted with Allah and with his names and with his attributes and what is necessitated from the wisdom of Allah and his praiseworthiness. So let the one who is truly sincere to himself Pay attention and look and repent to Allah and seek the forgiveness from Allah from having bad thoughts about his Lord. And if you were to look and to examine whoever you wish to examine and look into, you will see that he is distressed regarding the decree, the qadr of Allah and the decree of Allah and he blames it. And he believes that things should have been different, should have been like this or should have been like that, either less or more than what has taken place. So Ibn Qayyim said, so examine your souls. Are you safe? Then he mentions that it is said, if you are saved from it, then you are saved from something great. Otherwise, I cannot regard you as one who is saved. Naam. So that's the end, end of the words of Ibn Qayyim, rahimahullah ta'ala. As for the explanation, then Shaykh Ahmed al-Najmi, rahimahullah, he said that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has informed us in these various ayat regarding that which goes through the minds and the souls of the hypocrites that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that he does not aid his messenger 
and that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will not complete and fulfill the goal and the affair of his prophet. And this is how they used to think, those munafiqeen. This is how they used to think. And then he says, and then he said, وَبِلْ أَخَسْ And in specific, and especially when a calamity befalls the messenger, sallallahu alayhi wa and his companions. This is what they used to think. And in an ayah, in Surah Al-Fatih, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said here, the meaning of which is, but you thought that the messenger, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, and the believers would never return to their families ever. And that, and that was made pleasing to your hearts. And you made an assumption of evil and became a people who were ruined. Surah Al-Fatih, ayah number 12. And it was reported, as he mentioned, from Al-Jaddi ibn Qais, that when the Prophet wasallam and his companions, they left out to Tabuk, that they said, meaning the Munafiq, that the munafiqeen, Allahu A'lam, that seems to be the intent here, that they said, it is as if I can see, or I am with Muhammad, meaning that I can see Muhammad Sallallahu and his companions as if they were tied together with a rope, going out to this battle. So then Shaykh Ahmed al-Najmi mentions that the previously mentioned ayah from Surah Ali Imran is concerning what occurred at Uhud. The battle of Uhud, of course, the messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam went out to meet the, the, the mushrikeen who had come to fight him from Mecca. So they had traveled from Mecca to harm and to kill the messenger of Allah and to destroy Islam and its people. So went out with him also, Abdullah ibn Ubay, ibn Salul, the chief of the munafiqeen, he went out also. So when they were close to the place of battle, Abdullah ibn Ubay, the munafiq, he turned around and went back and he took a third of the army with him. And this was of course intended to dishearten the Muslims, to dishearten them and to make them feel as if they were going to be defeated. So the previously mentioned ayah from Surah Ali Imran is concerning what occurred at Uhud, wherein Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala informs us regarding the hypocrites, that their condition is in contradiction, in opposition to the condition of the believers. So the believers, when the calamity and affliction became severe upon them, Allah brought upon them slumber and sleep as a safety from himself. Such that one of them, meaning one of the sahaba, he had with, with him in his hand a sword. So when Allah brought upon them sleep, that it slipped out of his hand. As for the hypocrites, they were in the opposite state to this. They were seized with discomfort and unease, and fear, anxiety, distress, and apprehension. Because they were not overtaken by this slumber that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had placed upon the believers. Because the believers were, were tranquil, serene, at ease in their souls with the realization and the knowledge that Allah will aid his messenger and aid the companions and that the good end, that the end result, the good end result is for them. As for the hypocrites, then when hardship and affliction befell the messenger of Allah sallallahu or when some of his companions were killed, those hypocrites, they thought that Islam had come to an end. That the Messenger of Allah وسلم, was dead. He and his Sahaba were dead. And in their chests, meaning the souls and, the, and, and within themselves, the hypocrites, they were anticipating the victory for the idol worshippers. And they were anticipating destruction of Islam and its people. So Allah rebuked them and criticized them for this thought. And he disparaged them due to that. 
in numerous places throughout the Quran. And from them, Isratul Hajj, Man kana yadunnu an lain yansurahu Allahu fi dunya wal akhirah, fal yamdud bi sababin ila samai, thumma li yakta, yudhibanna kaiduhu ma yagheed. Wherein Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has said that whomsoever thinks that Allah will not help, meaning the Prophet, meaning that whomsoever thinks that Allah will not help the Prophet in this world and in the hereafter, then let him stretch out a rope to the ceiling and let him strangle himself. Then let him see whether his plan will remove that which he is angry with. Surah Al Hajj, ayah number 15. So Allah refuted them in their claim that if they had remained in their houses, that they claimed that they would not have been killed, meaning that if they did not go out to Uhud, and they remained in their houses that they would not be killed. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said to them, قُلْ لَوْ كُنْتُمْ فِي بِيُوتِكُمْ لَبَرَزَ الَّذِينَ كُتِبَ عَلَيْهُمُ الْقَتْلُ إِلَى مَدَاجِعِهِمْ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, Say, even if you had remained in your homes, then for those whom death had been decreed, it would have reached them in their places, meaning even in their beds it would have reached them, in their places of their death. وَلِيَبْتَلِيَ اللَّهُ ما في صدوركم وليمحص ما في قلوبكم والله عليم بذات الصدور. and then Allah subhanahu wa taala mentions that He might test you and test what is in your breasts and that He might purge your hearts meaning purify them and indeed Allah knows what is in the chests. so Allah subhanahu wa taala informs us that whatever befalls His messengers and their followers is due to a wisdom. is due to a wisdom because of course one of the points that Ibn Qayyim makes is that, f- that people believe that there is no connection between the decree of Allah and the wisdom of Allah. So, whatever Allah decrees, even some of the hardships that came upon the Sahaba radiallahu anhum, that it is due to a wisdom from Allah. And from those affairs that are considered from the wisdom of Allah, that Allah writes the shahada or the martyrdom for whomsoever He wishes, from his believing servants. That meaning, even if they die in the battle, and this is not a loss in reality, because Allah has written for them that they are martyrs, they are shuhada, they are, that he is shaheed, the one who dies in the battlefield. And likewise, from the wisdom of Allah, is that those who go out to battle, and those that stay behind, there is a difference between the believers and the hypocrites. And Allah puts to test the hypocrites, so that what is in their hearts and is concealed comes out. And it did and it did come out. Because they said what they said. That they said that if you had remained in your homes, as is mentioned in the ayah in Surah Ali Imran, that they said, Yaqulun Lokana Lana min al Amri Shayun Ma Kutilna Hahuna that that if we had anything to do with the affair, we would not have been killed here. Meaning that the Muslims they would not have been killed at the Battle of Uhud. So that which was in their test chest it came out. They didn't want to obey the messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wasallam. And we already mentioned what happened with the chief of the hypocrites when he went out with the believers, with the sahaba radiallahu anhum, him and his followers from the munafiqeen, that they returned back. That they returned back so as to dishearten the Muslims. So the Muslims now had lost a third of their fighting force because of this. So this is why Ahmed al-Najmi, he mentions... That Allah puts to test the hypocrites so that what is in their hearts and is concealed comes out. And that he purges and purifies the believers that remain alive, those believers that survived the battle. And they remain alive throughout their lives. That Allah tests them and tries them. And those tests and their trials multiply their reward and multiplies their good deeds. Allah writes for them their rewards. And thereafter the good ending is for the messengers. And the good end was for the messenger in the end. Because Allah aided him against his enemies. He may have, of course, had a setback at the Battle of Uhud, where 70 of the companions were killed. But nevertheless, the end result was for the believers. The aqiba was for the muttaqin, was for the pious, righteous believers. The messenger of Allah and his sahaba. Allah aided him against his enemies. And Allah made manifest his religion and made uppermost his word, raised his word high. He destroyed, meaning Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, destroyed the hopes of the transgressors, the oppressors, from the mushrikeen and the munafiqeen. So all praise is due to Allah for that. As for the relevance of the chapter 
heading to the book because returning back to the chapter heading you may wonder what has the chapter heading got to do with kitab al-tawheed the chapter yadhunnuna billahi ghayra al-haqqi dhanna al-jahiliya that they thought wrongly of Allah the thought of jahiliya then Ahmed al-Najmi rahimahullah he said the relevance is that the people of evil thoughts are not from those established as the people of Tawheed. They are not from Ahlul Iman, from those whose hearts are certain regarding the prevalence of this religion and the manifestation of this religion after facing trials. Because just because a person faces a trial, just because at a certain stage the Muslims are weakened, it does not mean that Islam will not prevail. Islam will prevail regardless. So, Ahlul Iman, they believe this with certainty. And this is what is required from the people of Iman in every age. It is necessary to believe that Allah will make manifest His religion and make His word uppermost. And that trials and hardships and setbacks can come in the path that leads to Allah's aid and Allah's victory. And then the end result is praiseworthy. So these are realities, barakallahu feekum, with regard to the tawheed of Allah and the tawheed, establishment of the tawheed of Allah upon Allah's earth. That setbacks will happen. Hardships will occur. Trials will be in the path to victory. So all of these hardships are upon the straight path that lead to Allah's aid and victory coming about. Barakallahu feekum. And then upon that, the chapter comes to an end this particular chapter and of course you can see what it's related to which is the chapter that comes after that and that is the issue of the pre-decree and the denial of the pre-decree of Allah so this is likewise this chapter that we have discussed is connected to the pre-decree of Allah because the pre-decree of Allah is connected to the wisdom of Allah and it is connected to the power of Allah to the, to the ability of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and Allah's far-reaching wisdom. And this is something that the munafiqeen and those weak in Iman and those weak in Tawheed that they don't understand. And they think that when you go out in the cause of Allah and that when you strive in the cause of Allah and you face a setback, then they say, this is Allah, there is no decree of Allah. Or that they'll say that the decree of Allah has no wisdom in it. You know, this is what they'll claim. And you find it even today. And this is what is intended by that chapter, that they think wrong thoughts regarding Allah, the thoughts of ignorance. This is how they think. And they say, don't we have anything to do with the affair? Meaning that they themselves, we have nothing to do with the affair. Then we say the affair, all of it belongs to Allah. So no doubt that people will always come and they will come with these thoughts and these ideas. But Tawheed and the establishment of Tawheed, walillahi alhamd, and it keeps us away from those evil thoughts, the thoughts of ignorance, wherein Sheikh Ahmed al-Najmi here throughout the whole of this chapter has refuted those evil thoughts regarding Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen wa sallallahu ala nabiyyina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'een. Can a woman on her menstrual cycle perform umrah? The answer is, that she cannot perform the tawaf and she cannot perform the sa'i in umrah. The reason being is because for the umrah, for the tawaf rather, tahara, meaning that a woman being pure from her menses is a condition. She cannot perform the tawaf in a state of menstrual impurity. As for the sa'i, she cannot perform the sa'i because the sa'i in umrah can only be performed after the tawaf. So she, since she cannot perform the tawaf, she cannot perform the sa'i. So therefore she must wait up until she is pure from her menses. And then she can perform the tawaf and the sa'i. As for her reaching the miqat, whether she is upon an airplane or upon a vehicle, then when she reaches the miqat, she must enter into the state of ihram because the menstruation does not prevent from entering into ihram. So she must enter into ihram when she reaches the miqat, just like everybody else. So she enters into a state of ihram. 
And the ihram of the woman, of course, is her normal clothing, except that she cannot wear the niqab. She cannot tie the niqab, nor wear the gloves. No. But everything else is normal. And of course, then she enters into a state of ihram. And she cannot cut her hair or apply perfume or clip her nails and so on. Wallahu alam. What is the correct method of descending into the sajda? Is it with the hands? F- is it with the uh, knees first, or with the hands first? And the scholars they differ with regard to how a person should enter into the state of sajda. Does he enter with the knees or with the hands? Ibn Uthaymin, rahimahullah taala, then he mentioned that the preferred position and the preferred method is with the knees. And Sheikh Al-Albani, rahimahullah ta'ala, mentioned several narrations mentioning that the preferred position is that a person enters into sajda by falling on his hands first. Allahu A'lam. And each of them, of course, have their proofs. What is the correct position from the ulama regarding perfumes with alcohol? Is this a type of najasa? Then again, the scholars, they differ with regard to whether alcohol that intoxicates, whether it is impure or not impure then what seems to be most correct and this is the position of Sheikh Muhammad bin Salih al-Uthaymeen is that it is not najasa it is not an impurity it is not an impurity so therefore uh, it can be used for example in perfumes and it's forbidden as Ibn Uthaymeen mentions is in its ingestion that you drink it that is what is forbidden this is the position with alcohol, that its foulness, its khubth, is in its drinking and its intoxication. As for using it to clean a wound or something similar to that, then that does not make it forbidden. Is it permissible for a man with excessive hair to remove hair from the areas such as his chest or his back or his legs and so on? And yes, this isn't, I do not know of any evidence that forbids that. And some of the scholars, they mention that there's no evidence that forbids that. What is forbidden, of course, is for the man or the woman, for that matter, to, number one, to play around with the eyebrows by plucking them and shaping them and so on. And likewise for the man, that he is not to remove the hair from his beard, except after, as Sheikh Al-Albani has mentioned, with his narrations back to the Sahaba, such as Abu Huraira and Ibn Umar, that a person, that a man may take a fist, take the fist of his beard, and what remains beyond the fist he may take from. And of course, he trims back the, uh, the mustache, and that is what he's, he's allowed, rather obligated to do, to trim the mustache and to let the beard grow. Uh, as for the woman, then if she has facial hair other than her eyebrows, then she is allowed to remove them from her cheeks or her chin, or upon her upper lip, she is allowed to remove them, as the scholars have mentioned from them, Sheikh Abdul Aziz bin Baz. Naam. As, as for the man removing the, the hair off his chest and so on, and if he wishes to do so, I do not know of any forbidden. Allahu Ta'ala A'lam. Will the jinn be standing with mankind on the day of resurrection? Allahu A'lam, where they'll be standing with, but they'll be judged, just like mankind is judged. As for where they will be standing, Allahu A'lam. What do you say about the one who says that I can listen to the rules online and never come to the gatherings? Then uh, Sheikh Al-Fawzan, Hafizahullah Ta'ala, mentioned that this is not the way of seeking knowledge. The way of seeking knowledge is not through tapes and books. Rather, it is by the attendance of the durus and the circles of the people of knowledge. And of course, we refer here to the ulama of Al-Islam. That a person should should sit in their durus and take from them. As for audios and online lectures and so on, no doubt it helps. It is a strengthening of one's knowledge, but it is not. A person does not say, well, I'm a student of knowledge, and where did you get your knowledge? I got it on the internet. This is not considered to be when knowledge is sought. Barakallahu feekum. Knowledge is sought from the durus and from the gatherings of knowledge. And if he is sitting in his house all the time, Allahu A'lam, you know, where is he praying and where he's taking his knowledge from, even online, 
because it's not easy these days. Uh, and you find that a lot of the brothers and sisters who say this, especially the brothers, because women have an excuse because they are more likely to stay in their house, and the house is their place anyway. But with regard to the brothers, more uh, you find quite often those who say that we are at home learning knowledge from the Mashaykh online and so on, and from the brothers online. That in reality, that doesn't take place. It is just a hope that they have, that they will one day sit down and start listening to the Durus online. Very few brothers do that. Very few brothers do that. Wallahu a'lam. Salatul Tasbih. Then the scholars have a difference of opinion over Salatul Tasbih, whether it is authentic or not authentic. A group of them say it is sahih. And a group of them regard it to be something that is not authentic. But it is narrated from a group of the Tabi'een. That they narrate it from the Prophet Sallallahu And from the Sahaba radiallahu anhum that they used to perform it. And some of the scholars regard those narrations to be sahih, so that's the opinion that a, that a body of the ulama hold, and a body hold that, the, that all of those narrations are weak and none of them are sound. Allahu a'lam. Jazakumullahu khaira. If there are the rules going on, such as, for example, al uh, the aqeedah of Imam al-Tahawi, or wasatiyah other than that, then, can, then should we attend even though we have not finished the uh, sharh of Asul al-Thalatha or studied Asul al-Thalatha then yes you can go and you should go because actually what you study in the Aqeedah of Imam al-Tahawi with of course the correct sharh such as the sharh of uh, Sheikh al-Fawzan and other than him that what you are studying actually is sometimes outside the realm outside the arena of, uh, of uh, Salatul Usul, outside of that arena, because Salatul Usul is very limited to a particular subject matter, and that is Tawheed, and calling upon Allah, and Tawheedul Uluhiyya, and defining Tawheed, and so on. Whereas the Aqeedah of Imam Al-Tahawi covers a large number of topics, such as, for example, the decree of Allah, the Sahaba radiallahu anhum, it covers the hellfire and paradise and the punishment of the grave and so on and so forth. You know, a vast number of topics, the rulers and how to deal with them. So all of those are covered and they are not covered in in the Asul Thalatha. So therefore, yes, you should attend. Barakallahu feekum. So upon that note, Jazakumullahu khairan, we'll conclude for today. And, and the dars tomorrow for the sisters, uh, or brothers and sisters actually, in fiqh, in Bulughul Maram, the explanation of Sheikh Al-Fawzan, will be at 11 a.m. tomorrow morning. Bidhanillahi ta'ala. Wa jazakumullahu khaira.